Well, what I'm doing in my last talk here is uh, describing how the cosmos gives us reasons to believe in Jesus Christ. Not just reasons to believe in God, but in Jesus Christ. And as I was mentioning uh, in the first service, um, one of the things I'm involved in, it's uh, thanks to the internet, you can have these video conversations with thousands of people at the same time. They just jump in, you get to see them on video, they get to see you. And uh, there's an atheist that sponsors uh, a kind of di a video discussion. And he has me on quite frequently. And uh, one time I was fielding these questions and this woman in Ireland said, I understand how you show that there must be an agent beyond the universe that created the universe. But how do you show that that agent is a god? And then how do you go from deism to theism, where it's a personal God, and then from theism to Jesus Christ, the creator God of the Bible. And can you do that for me without using the Bible? Just use the science. And I said, well, there's three different ways that I can think of that that can be done uh, in relatively short order. And she said, give me all three. Well, it took about 45 minutes to give her all three. I'm only gonna give you one of the three this morning. Uh, but yeah, there's other ways it can be done uh, as well. And uh, yeah, it really made a big difference in her life. And so here's an outline of what we're going to cover. How looking at the universe, how can we first establish that there's a God beyond space and time, a transcendent God that exists? Then how can we move from a transcendent God to a God that's personal and loving, and then to a redeeming God? a God that delivers us uh, from our sins and enters into a permanent relationship with us. Now, if you were here last night, I told the story of how I got interested in astronomy. It happened when I was seven years of age. And uh, you know, I was asking my parents, are the stars hot? And they said, yes, the stars are hot. And I said, can you tell me why they're hot? And they said, no, but we encourage you to go to the library. And I did. Well, one of the books I read at the library at age seven was a book by Fred Hoyle titled Nature of the Universe. And if you read the book, you can see that Fred is very anti-Christian. I was amazed at how much of the book supposedly about the universe was actually bad-mouthing the Christian faith and the Bible in particular. But at one point in Nature of the Universe, Fred Hoyle said this about the Bible. He says, there's a good deal of cosmology in the Bible. It is a remarkable conception. And later on in my life, when I was a teenager and began to look at the different religions of the world, I discovered that the Bible says more than 10 times as much about the origin and history of the universe as all the rest of the world's holy books combined. Hoyle was right. It says a lot about the universe. And in particular, it says a lot about the beginning of the universe. It's not just Genesis 1-1 that speaks about the universe having a beginning. There are multiple verses that speak about the beginning of the universe. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, then you have in the New Testament, Hebrews 11:3, the universe that we can detect did not come from that which we can detect. And I mentioned last night how the heavens and the earth refers to the totality of physical reality. The Hebrews meant not just all matter and energy, but all space and time. And I don't have the passages up here, but there's actually verses in the Bible that talk about God being active before he creates space and time. So God was doing things before he created the universe, before he even created uh, space and time. In fact, what fascinated me is that God actually begins his work of redeeming human beings from their sins before he creates time. 2 Timothy 1.9, the grace of God that we now experience was put into effect before the beginning of time. Or Titus 1.2, the hope that we share in Jesus Christ was given to us before the beginning of time. This actually helps us understand the creation. 
Everything that God creates is for the purpose of redeeming billions of human beings. And so, why He created was for the purpose of redemption. He begins His works of redemption first. But what I noticed was that the Bible stands alone in saying that God created space and time rather than God creating within space and time. If you look at the Hindu Vedas, the Buddhist commentaries, you look at the non-biblical faiths of the religions of the world, they all teach that God or gods or cosmic forces create within space and time that eternally exists. The Bible stands apart and says God creates independent of space and time. Space and time don't exist until God creates the universe. So this is a way of distinguishing the God of the Bible from the gods of the non-biblical faiths in the sense that they say space and time are eternal. The Bible says space and time are temporal. They were created when God brought the universe into existence. Now, I have in my briefcase a packet of space-time theorems. And these are theorems that were developed from 1970, literally until just a year ago. And these theorems all have in common that if the universe contains mass and if general relativity reliably describes the movements of bodies in the universe, then space and time must have a beginning. Space and time must be created. And it's because of the force of these space-time theorems that even atheist physicists and astronomers concede there must be an agent beyond space and time that created everything. And this is basically a deistic worldview, the idea that there's a God that creates the universe. But in deism, it's a God that pays no attention to his creation after he creates it. He basically takes a 14 billion year nap after he creates the universe. That's deism. And so the challenge is, how do you go from deism to theism? But one thing I want to encourage you, when you look at the uh, trend of debates between Christians and atheists in physics and astronomy, deism is no longer the subject of debate. Because of the force of the space-time theorems, even people like Lawrence Krauss, in his book, A Universe from Nothing, concedes that deism cannot be taken off the table. Deism is something that has been scientifically established. And so when I debate atheists, astronomers, and physicists now, the debate is about whether or not God is personal. This is a position of Stephen Hawking. Hawking believes there must be something beyond the universe that creates the universe and sets up the laws of physics. But he thinks that's all that happens. He's adamant that that God is not a personal being, not a being that watches us, not a being that cares for anything in his creation. I say the same thing's true of Lawrence Krauss. So that's where the debate has shifted. It's not over whether or not there's a God, it's whether or not the God is a personal being. And so what I want to do is take you to actually a text, a challenge. Is God personal? And did he design the universe and the earth for the redemption of billions of human beings? But when I began to read the Bible for the first time at age 17, the thing I noticed, the Bible actually says more about the expansion of the universe than it does the beginning of the universe. That's an important deal from an Old Testament perspective, how much the Bible focuses on the fact that we live in an expanding universe. Now, this is quite evident when you read the Bible in a non-English language. The problem with the English language is we have an enormous vocabulary, and so most of our English translations will translate these passages as the stretching out of the heavens. But these are a sampling of passages in the Bible that talk about the stretching of the heavens. But the verb that's translated as stretching is the Hebrew verb nata and it means the expansion of what's being described. And what's interesting about these 11 passages is that it uses the verb nata in all three Hebrew verb forms. This is important because, as I mentioned last night, 
I've debated the executive director of the Skeptic Society four times on university campuses. And this comes up, and he says, these 11 texts are not talking about the expansion universe. He insists they're just simply figures of speech. At best, they're metaphors. It's not talking about a literal expansion universe. Now, the reason why Michael Shermer is so insistent about this he knows if he concedes that these texts are actually talking about the expansion of the universe, that means the Bible stood alone for thousands of years as being the only book in the hands of humanity that talked about the expansion of the universe. And today we've got overwhelming proof that the universe is expanding. And therefore he realizes that if he concedes this, he's conceding a God that's involved beyond the moment of creation. Job 9.8 makes the point God alone expands the universe. God takes credit uh, for the expansion of the universe. But as I've explained to Michael and the audiences I've addressed, the verb nata is in all three Hebrew verb forms, which means these can't be just figures of speech. It's literally speaking about the continual expansion of the universe. Now, Shermer's response is, he says, well, you're a 21st century astronomer. You're reading that into the text with hindsight. You already know the universe is expanding. Well, a good response is this. Jewish theologians living 800 years ago, they saw this in the text. And they concluded, the Old Testament is declaring we live in an expanding universe. And they said that 700 years before any scientist had a clue from science that the universe is expanding. Now, as I've mentioned, Today, we have overwhelming evidence that indeed the universe expands. And I've written a whole book on this. We don't have it at the table out there. It's called The Creator and the Cosmos. In fact, we're bringing out a brand new edition in February, the fourth edition of The Creator and the Cosmos, and gives basically the latest responses to the atheist attempts to avoid concluding that the God of the Bible uh, created. That book gives you the best evidence that we live in an expanding universe. What I'm going to give you this morning is just one visual demonstration that we live in an expanding universe. And it's thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope. So thank you for showing all these Hubble images during your worship service. Here's a couple of more. On the left there, you see galaxies that are 12 billion light years away, which means we're seeing them as they were 12 billion years ago. And what you see there is that the galaxies are jammed so tightly together, they're tearing spiral arms off one another. And the one on the right shows galaxies that are only 2 billion light years away. So we're seeing them as they were 2 billion years ago. And I've put both of these images to the same spatial scale. So you can see how the galaxies have moved apart from one another and no longer are they tearing spiral arms off one another. Now, these are two images. Thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, I could show you 20. But it demonstrates that indeed, as the universe gets older and older, the galaxies get farther and farther apart from one another in the way that we would expect if the universe is continuously expanding from a space-time beginning. Now, today we know What's most responsible for the expansion of the universe? How many of you have ever heard of dark energy? Could I see some hands? Oh, a lot of you know about dark energy. It wasn't discovered until 1999, so it's a relatively new discovery about the universe. But dark energy makes up three quarters of all the stuff of the universe. Isn't it amazing that we human beings have been ignorant about three quarters of the universe until 1999? Well, let me share you some things about dark energy. Dark energy makes up three quarters of all the stuff of the universe. Dark energy is an energy that's embedded in the space surface of the universe. Now, the universe is kind of like planet Earth. On planet Earth, we've got a three-dimensional body, and as human beings live on the two-dimensional surface. The universe is four dimensions, but all the stars and galaxies are on the three-dimensional surface of the four-dimensional expanding universe. And the universe's surface gets bigger and bigger as it gets older and older. But as it gets bigger and bigger, dark energy becomes progressively more powerful 
and its capacity to accelerate the space surface of the universe. Now, if you expand the space surface of the universe too quickly from the cosmic creation event, the primordial gas of the universe will never be collapsed by gravity into galaxy stars and planets. The universe will be expanding so rapidly that none of that gas will get collapsed. And without galaxy stars and planets, there is no life. Now, on the other hand, if you expand the universe too slowly from the cosmic creation event, gravity will collect all the cosmic gas and crush it into nothing but black holes and neutron stars, where the density exceeds two billion tons per level teaspoonful. Can you imagine having a cup of coffee, putting a teaspoon in, and it's two billion tons? That density is so extreme that molecules are impossible, atoms are impossible, even protons and electrons are impossible, and of course, life is impossible. Now, what my colleagues have done is they've calculated the degree to which you have to fine-tune dark energy to make life possible in the universe, to have it expand at exactly the right rate throughout cosmic history so that you can get uh, life. And the answer is you have to fine-tune dark energy to one part in 10 to the 122nd power. That's 122 zeros after the one. Actually, quite a bit bigger than our national debt. Okay. <laughs> it's even bigger than the number of protons and neutrons in the entire universe. And it's such a large number that lay people can't get their head around what it means. But I'm going to give you a try. Okay, we're going to compare the fine tuning design of dark energy with the very best example of human inventiveness and engineering achievement. And the instrument that's way ahead of any other in that category is LIGO. It's a gravity wave telescope situated in the state of Washington, Louisiana, with a third wing now in Pisa, Italy. This machine is so amazing, it can make measurements to a tenth of the diameter of a proton over a scale of four kilometers. It's by far the most sophisticated machine we human beings have ever designed and built. But if we compare the fine-tuning design in this epitome of human achievement with the fine-tuning design we see in dark energy to make life possible, the best that we human beings have ever uh, invented and designed falls short by a factor of 10 to the 97 times. 10 to the 97 times. Now, what does that imply? It implies that the one that designed dark energy at a minimum is 10 trillion 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 times more intelligent and more knowledgeable than the Caltech and MIT physicists that invented and designed this machine. Now, I was on the research faculty of Caltech for five years. I got to know these people. They're not dumb. They're highly educated. They're brilliant people, probably the most brilliant on the planet. And yet, the one that designed dark energy exceeds their intellect and knowledge by that much. Or I could frame it another way. At a minimum, the one that designed dark energy is 10 to the 97 times better funded than the US government <laughs> that made it possible for this amazing machine to be built. Now, I think you can get my point here. We're not just talking a transcendent God. We're talking a personal God, because attributes like intellect, knowledge, creativity, and power can only be possessed by a personal being. So here we've gone from deism to theism, just by looking at one feature of the universe. But it's not the only feature. What we discover, oh, let me just say this. I got this paper in my briefcase as well. You'd expect me, as a Christian astronomer, to draw this conclusion about dark energy. But the truth is, it's also being conceded by leading atheist theoretical physicists. And one of the papers I have is written by three theoretical physicists about dark energy. And the title of their paper is Disturbing Implications of a Cosmological Constant which is another term for dark energy. And 
This caught the attention of Philip Ball. Philip Ball is an atheist physicist and the senior physics editor for the British journal Nature. Nature is the most prestigious science journal in the world. And so he interviewed the three authors. And I'm going to pull for you a couple of quotes from that interview. And this is actually online. You can see it for yourself. One of the quotes of the three authors was, arranging the cosmos as we think it is arranged would have required a miracle. And here's the second quote. An unknown agent, namely beyond space and time, intervened in the evolution, that is the history of the universe, for reasons of its own. And this explains the title of the paper, Disturbing Implications. Because you can imagine, as three atheists, they would find out highly disturbing that if dark energy is real, then there's this agent beyond space and time performing miracles for reasons of his own. Which explains why you see this sentence at the end of the paper. This is the very last sentence in the research paper. Perhaps the only reasonable conclusion is we do not live in a world that is a universe with a true cosmological constant. They concluded their research paper with the idea, dark energy can't be true. It's got to be false, because if it's true, then we're stuck with this agent beyond space and time, performing miracles for reasons of his own. Now, the irony of this paper is it was published uh, just months before we astronomers came up with nine independent observational demonstrations that not only is dark energy real, it's the dominant component of the universe. Now, you can go to our reasons.org website because I wrote a one-page article on each of these nine discoveries. And they're written for a lay, lay audience. You don't have to be technically trained. But they are on rather technical observational subjects, like galaxy cluster X-rays, supernova, cosmic background radiation, and different galaxy surveys. But if you go to that URL there, you'll not only see those nine articles, uh, you'll see 16 more because today we have 25 independent observational demonstrations that not only is dark energy real, it's the dominant component of the universe, which means we really are stuck with an agent beyond space and time performing miracles for reasons of his own. We're not just talking deism, we're talking theism, a God that's personally involved in designing the universe for the specific benefit of us human beings. Now, if you were to ask me as a scientist, where do we find the most spectacular measurable evidence for fine-tuning design uh, by this personal God? I would say it's dark energy. But it's by no means the only one. Virtually every feature of the universe that we measure, or every feature of the laws of physics, shows us exceptional degree of fine-tuning design. So, for example, we recognize uh, that all the uh, forces of uh, physics have to be fine-tuned to make possible uh, design. So, just to give you one example, in order to have stars, you have to fine-tune the ratio of the gravitational force to the electromagnetic force to better than one part in 10,000 trillion trillion trillion. Say, so what happens if you don't? Either stars will never form, or stars will form and instantly explode, or you're not going to get the stars that you need to make life possible. It must be fine-tuned to that degree. And this is a list of other features of the universe and the laws of physics that likewise must be fine-tuned to that amazing degree. Now, if this is really evidence for the God of the Bible, we would expect that the list of fine-tuning indicators of this personal God will go up as we learn more about the universe. That's actually something you see in Psalms and Job, that the more we know about nature, the more evidence we'll see for the supernatural handiwork of the Creator. And so we, at Reasons to Believe, decided to put this to the test starting in 1991. And we would survey the scientific literature and collect all those evidences for this high degree of fine-tuning design. And this next table shows you how that list of evidences has grown as we learn more and more about physics and astronomy. 
And so you see as time goes by, the list gets longer and longer, it never gets shorter. The list today stands way above 200 different features of the universe and the laws of physics that show this exceptional high degree of fine-tuning design. Basically putting our Christian faith to the test. The more we learn about nature, the more evidence we accumulate for the supernatural handiwork of the Creator. This is exactly how we engage scientists on secular universities saying, we have a testable creation model, and this is one of the ways we can put our biblical creation model to a scientific test. Now, again, it's not unique to me. Uh, we have many physicists who have written about this fine-tuning design. Freeman Dyson, one of the more famous physicists in America today, not a believer, wrote this in his book, Disturbing the Universe. The more I examine the universe, the more evidence I find that the universe in some sense must have known we were coming. <laughs> the universe was designed in advance for us human beings. Now, in some sense you'd expect that because when we astronomers look at the universe, we don't see it as it is now. You know, I keep reminding my wife that because I'm an astronomer, I know nothing about the present. All of my data comes from the past. When you look at the sun, we don't see it as it is now, we see it as it was eight minutes ago, because that's how long it took the light to come to planet Earth. And so, because I'm an astronomer, I simply have to look farther and farther away to see what God has done at farther and farther times back in the past. And yeah, it does show that Freeman Dyson is making a correct observation. That as we look at the past universe, we can see that it's been step-by-step -step design for the appearance of first life and then human beings in particular. The universe in some sense did know in advance that we were coming. Or to put it more theologically correctly, the one that was designing the universe knew he wanted to prepare things for the entry of us human beings. But it's not only that the Creator knew that He was preparing things for us, He was preparing the universe, not just to be a home in which we can live. And that's what's wonderful. You know, what you'll see in why the universe is the way it is, the universe must be exactly the size that it is in order for human beings to exist. Just to have one planet Earth, you need 50 billion trillion stars. The mass of the universe must be fine-tuned, the size must be fine-tuned, the age must be fine-tuned. It goes all the way down the line just to provide a home for us. But not only is this universe exquisitely fine-tuned to make a home for us, it's exquisitely fine-tuned to make possible billions of us coming into a redeemed relationship with the creator of the universe in a period of time that's only thousands of years wide. The universe was designed for our redemption, for deliverance from the sins and the evil that we experience. Now, what I write about and why the universe is the way it is, is how every law of physics is designed to permanently remove evil and suffering uh, from uh, God's creation and humanity in particular. And one of the ways you see this is what you see in Romans chapter 8 where it says the entire universe is subject to a pervasive law of decay, a reference to the second law of thermodynamics. How we live in a universe where everything is decaying. No matter where you look, you see ongoing decay. If you don't believe me, look at the neighbors sitting next to you. Okay, we're all evidences of ongoing decay. Stars are running down, the galaxies are running down, everything is decaying but it's exactly what we need to bring about the end of all evil. And the good news is, when evil is eliminated, there will be no decay and no death. A time is coming. That's explicitly stated in Revelation chapter 21. But the point I'm making is that we live in a universe that's not only optimal for existence, it's optimal for the defeat and removal of evil and for willing human beings to receive redemption and an eternal loving relationship with their Creator. And just to pick the one example, I don't have time to go into gravity and electromagnetism and the strong and weak nuclear force and the other features of the universe, but I'm going to pick this law of decay, 
because it's the one feature of the universe that the Bible focuses on most in the context of the problem of evil. And we notice about the law of decay, the rate of decay, the rate at which things are running down is not so high as to discourage productive work. Now, everything we humans create goes down through decay. I mean, your car is decaying. You've got to replace it every once in a while. Probably the most extreme example I can think of is uh, yard work. Uh, my wife is always after me to, you know, do yard work. We've got a front yard and a backyard, and she, she wants it a certain way. But what I notice is it takes about six hours out of my weekend to get the yard looking the way she wants it to look. Two weeks later, I got to do another six hours to get it the way she wants it to look. In just two weeks, I got to start all over again. You know, if that rate of decay were any higher, I would give up on yard work altogether. <laughs> uh, as it is, it's pretty hard to motivate me. So, but fortunately, the rate of decay is not so high as to discourage us from doing any kind of work or creativity at all. On the other hand, is not so low as to let sin go unrestrained. And this is something you see right in Genesis chapter 3. The moment that Adam and Eve rebel against their creator and begin to commit sin and evil, God speaks to him and says, because of your decision, from now on, you will experience more pain in proportion to your sin. You're going to experience uh, more work in proportion to your sin, and you're going to waste more time. Basically, he's referring to the fact that because you're now in a state of sin and evil, you're going to have to do more work, you're going to experience more pain, and waste more time trying to undo the damage that's caused uh, by your sin and evil. Now, he biologically designed us, thanks to gravity and electromagnetism and thermodynamics and the other features of the universe, so that none of us enjoys extra pain, extra time being wasted, and uh, extra work. And so that motivates us to avoid evil and to pursue virtue, and to discover in the process that we need external help. You know, the more we try to live a virtuous life and avoid evil, the more that we discover we don't have it within us uh, to lead the kind of virtuous life that the laws of physics would encourage us to do. And that's basically God's message to saying, you need my help. And if you come to me for help, you will be able to overcome the sin and evil in your life. But if you don't come to me for help, it's not going to work. I'll give you an analogy. Um, when I entered the graduate astronomy program at the University of Toronto, our professor sat us down and said, you 13 are the cream of the crop. We know that you're very hardworking and that you're very uh, uh, intelligent. But no matter how intelligent you are, no matter how hardworking you are, you will not get your PhD unless you receive our help. We're here to help, but you're not going to make it without our help. Seven of my peers did not get their PhDs. Only six of us did. And it's because we sought the help of our professors. Likewise, God says, you're not going to make it without my help. But unlike my professors, God says, if you come to me for help, I guarantee that you will overcome the sin and evil in your life and enter into an eternal relationship with me in the new creation. And I remember explaining this to my sons when they were growing up and just saying, because they were saying, Dad, why are you doing all this discipline? I says, the reason I'm disciplining you is so that the laws of physics won't be disciplining you. If I don't discipline you, the laws of physics will. And, uh, you know, that's going to be more painful. Well, now that they're in their 20s, they said, Dad, the most painful thing about the discipline that you put us through was listening to your lectures on the laws of thermodynamics. So... <laughs> So it's because of the law of decay that we experience more pain, more work, and more wasted time. And again, if you want to learn more about this, there's a book out there called Why the Universe is the Way It Is. And I'll tell you a quick story about this. I was in an airport once, and they called my name. And I thought, boy, I'm getting bumped. Didn't happen. They said, you know, Mr. Ross, are you okay if we put you in first class? I said, I think I can handle that. So, 
It's one of just two times I flew first class, and uh, a gentleman sat down beside me, and like me, he never flies first class, but he says, I'm, I'm going to Microsoft. Uh, I'm going to be a consultant. He says, well, what do you do? And he says, well, I'm a, a quantum physicist. I'm from Germany. And he said, well, who are you? And I says, well, I'm not a quantum physicist. I'm an astrophysicist. I'm not from Germany. I'm from Canada. And then he said, well, I'm an atheist and a skeptic. Now, it's really rare that somebody jumps off and introduces himself like that right away. And I said, well, I'm a Christian. He said, this is going to be a really interesting flight. <laughs> he says, do you mind if I ask you questions? So for two hours, uh, he basically he had eight main questions. And he was asking questions like, well, if there's a God, why this horribly wasteful universe? Look at all these useless stars and galaxies. So I answered that question. He asked me seven more questions. And then he said, how come you got such well-prepared answers to my eight questions? <laughs> Well, I says, first of all, you're not the first person that's asked me those questions. And second of all, your questions are the chapter titles of my book, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. <laughs> and he says, you've got to be kidding. Well, I had a coffee in my briefcase. <laughs> he pulled it out <laughs> and saw, yeah, these are the questions I was asking. <laughs> I was able to give him a copy, and then he said, you don't have anything in German, do you? <laughs> I had one DVD in my briefcase. Uh, they're sold out now. It's ones we had last night, uh, Journey Toward Creation, and it was in German. And so he said, he was just so grateful for that. And now, as we walked towards baggage claim, he said, I've just calculated the mathematical probability of a German quantum physicist who's an atheist <laughs> having a conversation with a Canadian astrophysicist who's a Christian. It's less than one chance in two billion. And he said, I know what happened today is not an accident. Okay? All right. Let me share briefly about this book. It's, it's the newest book we have on science and faith. And uh, five years ago, I did a survey in our church on all the major creation texts in the Bible. And basically what it's showing them is how every creation text links the doctrine of creation with the doctrine of redemption. As I already shared with you, there's passages that talk about how God begins his works of redemption before he creates anything, which implies that everything that God creates is for the purpose of redemption. Then I spent three years going through the scientific literature to see if that's really true. The book basically documents every event in the history of the universe, Earth, and Earth's life, and every component of the universe, the Earth, and Earth's life plays a role in making possible the redemption of human beings. And I've had fun this last year just speaking on university campuses saying, no matter what scientific discipline you look at, the creation screams redemption. And it's amazing the conversations we've been able to have with scientists and engineers who are not yet believers. But let me close this out with a quote from Psalm 97, verse 6. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. You know, a lot of people in church know the passages that talk about the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens not only declare the glory of God, they declare the righteousness of God. It actually reveals an outline of the plan of how God wants to redeem billions of human beings unto himself. Thank you.